Um, so on the count of three, I want everybody to read this title together. One, two, three. All right. Good advice or bad advice? We'll see. All right. So uh, last week, Pastor Mike did a little sacred scripture myth busting with Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through who? That's it. There we go. That's it. Hey, motions help, right? I was a children's pastor in Texas for a while. It helps. It helps remember, um, help, helps you remember what it is. So I can do all things through who? That's right. Um, so I can go win that football game. I can go jump off a cliff and fly. No, 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 no. <laughs> How do we know that? Thank you, Sam. Context. Context matters so much. Context matters so much. And Pastor Mike helped us see this last week, uh, that that's not the true meaning that we find in the context of the entire passage. It's not that we can do anything that we want to do. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's not the football game verse. It's, it's that God will enable us to do anything or endure anything that he has called us to. So Paul was in these dire situations, these sufferings, pr- imprisoned, shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, all these things. He said, I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me, whether I have a lot or a little. That's the context. So whatever God calls us to, he will enable us to do those things. Amen? Amen. Context is key. And I said this a few weeks ago, the last time I got uh, the opportunity to share with our church family um, that a, I've, I've heard this phrase before, super confusing, but listen, a text without context is a pretext for a proof text. A lot of texty words. Everyone, we're texting today, okay? Uh, the, essentially, in other words, if you take Scripture out of the context of other Scripture, and how it's historically been understood and interpreted by the church, then you can make it mean something that it never was supposed to mean. If, if I take this, this text out of its context, I can make it into a text that it was never supposed to mean. That's essentially what that super confusing uh, phrase means. Um, most everyone in here has played the telephone game before, Yes? You know what I'm talking about when I say that? If you don't, um, you just imagine that we got everyone in the room and online to circle up together, and I told the first person in this, uh, in this circle, just chose one person, told them a message, and then they shared that message with the person next to them, and then so on and so on, all the way around, all the way around. What inevitably happens when you get back to like the end of that, that line? Yeah, it's, it's completely different. The message has changed. At some point, it's gone awry. Uh, someone has broken off from the original message that was given, um, and we, we don't have the same meaning uh, that, was, that was given to that first person in, in line. I've heard this as a critique of the Christian faith. I've heard this argument used as a critique of the Christian faith. Well, well that was... 2,000 years ago that Jesus handed this gospel, this good news to the apostles, and then they passed that on, and then so on and so on and so on and so on. So how, how do you know that today at the Fountain Church, we are living in the truth that Jesus gave to his apostles? Like, I think it's a, it's a valid criticism to consider but I don't think it stands up because of two things, two things, two distinct advantages that we have, that the church has, the Holy Spirit and history. We have these two things that will help us know the message that we have has not been perverted, that this is true and we can believe it. We believe that God would not allow the truth of his gospel to be uh, perverted or distorted beyond recognition. Right? That's the Holy Spirit. He, he gave the Holy Spirit to his church to preserve his truth and give them power to proclaim 
his truth in the world around us. So that's, that's that, that first distinct advantage that we have. Uh, he, he would not allow his gospel uh, to be twisted beyond recognition. And who would he entrust to be the guardians of his truth? The church. The church. Capital C, church. We can look back throughout the context of history and see what the capital C church Christians have consistently believed throughout the age of the church. We, we can't, that's history on our side. We've got the Holy Spirit, we've got history. We can look back and see, okay, all right, here's the consistent belief that we know, we can trace this all the way back to Jesus, that every Christian who is a Christian has believed and practiced these things. We can have security in that. We've got the Holy Spirit, we've got history on our side with this argument. And we can see, uh, because of that, because of that consistency that we can draw the line, we can also see when someone fell off the horse. And sometimes, literally, that happened. When someone fell off a horse and comes up with a doctrine that has never been believed and taught by the church throughout the ages. This happened in the 1800s. Uh, so the telephone game doesn't have to be the case when it comes to the Christian faith. Because we can go back. Remember, imagine this line of people again. Imagine this line of people, us in this room, and I've, I've shared this message with someone and it's been passed down. Imagine that we can, in this telephone game, what would prevent the person who's last in line from getting it wrong, if they could go back and ask the rest of the people in line, go back to the start and say, hey, what, what were you told? And then go, go to a few, few people up and say, hey, what, what were you told? And we can do this with history. There are documents that have been preserved by the early church fathers through councils where heresies were popping up and people were saying, oh, no, like, Jesus is only a spirit. You know, he's not truly a son of God and son of man. He's not human and divine. No, he's only spirit. No. Like, we know that's not true because of, of, of these councils and the truth that the Holy Spirit preserved through his church. Right? The telephone game is not a, not a good argument Against, uh, against the Christian faith. We know that we can go back and trace what we believe to the apostles um, who were given what the, the good news is by Jesus himself. But here's the thing. Does anyone in here know how many denominations there were the first thousand years of the church's existence? 1,000 years. How many denominations were there? One denomination. One church. Different geographical locations. One church. 1054 AD was the first big schism, and it split off into two denominations. All right? From that point forward, 500 years later, there were still only two denominations. Until the 1500s. Until the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation, Luther, Luther and other reformers, uh, they broke off from the Roman Catholic Church. Fast forward to today. Fast forward to today. Does anyone want to take a guess? How many denominations of churches there are today? That's a good guess. 40,000. Over 40,000 denominations of Christian churches today throughout the world. Yeah, I thought it was 30,000. I had to just fact check again for this sermon. And that, that number has increased since the time that I was in ministry school when I learned that. 40,000. And, and look, in some ways, this can be viewed as a testament to the beautiful diversity in the body of Christ, that there are different expressions. Like, we, we all are image bearers of God himself. We have all been given different personalities to express some aspect of God. Like, if everyone looked like Pastor Grant and acted like Pastor Grant, that would be a very limited view of God. We would know that God likes pizza, though and Taco Bell, but, yeah, no. But there's, there's a lot of things that we can learn from people who are different from us in these different expressions of faith, but like the, the tough part about this fact is that it can be confusing and disheartening, right? So, so out of all these 40,000 different denominations of the Christian church, which one is the right one? Well, it's the fountain. You came to the right place today. I'm just... No, that's completely facetious, all right? Look, I, 
We're not, we're not going to be prideful in claiming to be the one. You know, we've got it all figured out. Look, we're on a journey together. We are all in pursuit of truth. We're all in pursuit of God. We just want to take that one step closer to Jesus today, to the goodness, to the truth, and align our lives as best as possible to Jesus Christ. So I, I don't think, you know, maybe it's not a great question to ask, which one is the right one or everything. Man, that, that can be the source of so much conflict, and it, and it is. It is the source of so much conflict. I, I want to exam- take another step back from that and say, like, how did we come to this? And how could, we, how could we attain more unity in faith rather than divisiveness, right? That was Jesus. We, we know the Lord's prayer, our Father who art in heaven. We know that, but the Lord prayed a prayer in John chapter 17 for us that we would be one as he is with the Father. That should be our pursuit is to be unified in Christ Jesus. So, like, how would this happen? So I, I, would, I would suggest that it's through, like, individuals, and we can, we can just label them. We can, we can say uh, Pastor Billy Bob, all right? Reading the sacred scriptures um, and coming to his own conclusions and interpretations. And then Pastor Billy Bob goes and plants his own church with the same basic creed of faith, right? Not departing from those original truths, like every Christian has to believe these things, uh, but he plants it with these variances that began with him, his own personal interpretation. He says, well, no, this, this is the right way to interpret and believe this, because that's, that's what it looks like to me. So that's how it is, All right? He does this, and listen, we do this whenever we read and interpret and apply Scripture outside of context. Context is key to correct interpretation and application. All right, I'm gonna say this one more time, and if you wanna write something down today, this is a great thing to write down if you're a note taker. Uh, I, I love doing this so I can go back and reflect on some of this stuff. Is this right here. Context is key for correct interpretation and application for our lives. Like, this is it. We've got to know the context so we know what is it that this is actually saying. All right, so just to, just to kind of help us all understand this point, how important context is, um, uh, we're going to put a phrase up on the screen. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, I want everyone to read this all together. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, that's good. That's very good. Now I'm going to ask this. Does everyone understand what that means? I gave you this message. Does everyone understand the meaning behind that message, what I'm communicating? Feel like it? Like, yeah, feel pretty confident about this. Seven words. Like, come on. I know English. I got that. But listen. If you don't know context, you can walk away with seven, di- seven, dif- seven different, goodness, seven different meanings of this one simple sentence. I never said you stole my wallet. I never said you stole my wallet. I never said you stole my wallet. Maybe I implied it. I never said you stole my wallet. Maybe it was somebody else. I never said you stole my wallet. Maybe you hid it somewhere. I never said you stole my wallet. You stole somebody else's. I'm implying that. I never said you stole my wallet. Maybe you stole my car. There's seven different ways to understand this if you don't understand the author's intention, the context. And this is what we do with the sacred scriptures all the time. This is why Pastor Billy Bob can read this and come to a wild, wacky conclusion and say, no, this is actually how it is, when he's separating himself from the context of the history of the church and the Holy Spirit's divine revelation to the apostles that they've passed down throughout the ages. Like, this is good. And I love that it can be this simple of saying, like, no, I actually can discover truth. I don't, ha- it takes so much pressure off friends. When I, when I discovered this, this took so much weight off my shoulders that you mean I, I personally 
don't have to read this complex collection of documents that we call the Bible and have to interpret every single thing on my own to come to the conclusion of what this is saying. How many of you, you guys have tried to read Revelation before? It's okay that that's a hard book. It's okay that the prophets are hard to understand. Look, we have church history and the Holy Spirit on our side that we can rely on. You don't have to sit in a prayer closet and like, what is this? What is this speaking? It's good to read the Bible on your own and see how God's going to apply that to your life. That's a good, good practice. But man, we can, we can take so much pressure off when we say, okay, Lord, I want to know your truth. What have you been teaching your people throughout the 2,000 years that the church has existed? And we can go back and look at that. So, and... and this is, this is so important. Like, I don't get to read the sacred scriptures and decide what they mean for myself. I don't get to do that. That's an arrogant way to live. I am not the sole arbiter of truth. Every Bible-believing Christian, what, what should every Bible-believing Christian believe is the pillar and foundation of truth. According to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it is the church, not Grant Adams, not Kate O'Connor. We don't have it figured out. But God has given his church the Holy Spirit, and he has given us the consistency of history to be able to look back and say, what have you been saying, Lord? I want to know. I want to know. Can you show me? We've been listening to that with Josephine. Tarzan soundtrack. Stuck in my head, man. But yeah, Grant Adams is not the church. I'm an individual member of it. God is not going to give me a special uh, revelation and interpretation of his word on some golden tablets in the woods by myself that differs from thousands of years of orthodox Christian beliefs and practices. If he did, I'd have to change my name to Joseph Smith because that's, that's what happened. That's what he claims happened. The founder of Mormonism claimed that this happened, separating himself from the Holy Spirit's revelation that he gave to his church and consistently taught for 2,000 millennium, or for two millennium. He said, no, God gave me this specific interpretation. Boom, now we have the LDS. For some people, that's a convincing argument, but not for me. And I would, I would think that that's not a convincing argument for many people in our midst today. But there's safety in standing on a firm foundation, not just what one man has to say. Amen? That's what we, that, that's like the, the foundation of this message today is context. Context is the key to correct interpretation and application. So now we get to get to the actual sermon part because we've built this foundation. So here we go, all right? One more time, let's all read the title together. One, two, three. Follow your heart. Here's the question. Is this good advice? Oh. <laughs> we got a lot of no's. We got some yes. We got a maybe. I like it. I like that. All right, let's look at what the sacred scriptures say in context, okay, according to the scriptures, because this is advice. I don't know if you have heard this in our culture and society today. This is important advice that is being pushed and given all, 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 all the time. Follow your heart, follow your heart, do what you want. Pursue your desires. You are your desires. That defines you, that's who you are. All right, follow your heart. What does the sacred scriptures say? According to the scriptures, this is terrible advice. Let's look in Jeremiah chapter 17, starting in verse five. We're gonna read verses five and six. And verses 9 and 10. Here we go. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength, and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper in the Arabah. He cannot see when good comes, but dwells in the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one lives. Here's a big one. I hear this quoted a lot of times when it comes to this message right here, this piece of advice. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. 
So, not great advice. Follow your heart. Not great advice according to Jeremiah right here. Not great advice. And why, why not? Like, what's all of our problem? Starts with an S. Sin is the problem. Yes, sin is the problem. Who is the solution? Jesus is the solution, all right? This has been humanity's problem from the very beginning, and sin is the reason why follow your heart is terrible advice. All right, we can look back through biblical history, okay, context, and see uh, people like Saul, King Saul, following this advice, offering a sacrifice instead of the, allowing the priest to get there and offer that sacrifice. It didn't end well for Saul. David, following his heart, When he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof, following his heart, his desire to pursue her, and then ends up murdering her husband, following his heart. The Israelites uh, fashioning a golden calf to worship. The Israelites going and turning and worshiping uh, the gods of the nations around them. They were following their hearts on that one. Judas betraying Jesus following his heart of greed. Maybe there were underlying motives, but he was following his heart on that decision. It's, it's not hard even like, to honestly reflect on our own lives today. Like, can we do that just for a moment? Be honest like, for yourself to reflect back on your life and see how following our hearts has led us to heartbreak. The, the biggest one I can think of are uh, relationships, and tragically, my, my heart was broken as a younger man because I took this advice and ran with it, right? I, I said, this must be what God wants for me because I want this so bad. Ah, oh, man, I, she's so beautiful. I want to be with her. Like, of course, this must be what God wants for me. No. No terrible advice, young Grant. Don't follow that. But praise God for his mercy and allowing me to be brokenhearted so that I could find his good, perfect, and pleasing will in my sweet wife, Bridget. My goodness, God is merciful. He is so good. And friend, I have friends today who've walked away from their relationship with God because they've followed this advice. Getting into a relationship with someone who's not a Christ follower or, or giving themselves over to same-sex attraction. This is so hard. This is so hard. Or, or giving themselves over to extramarital intimacy. Or, or arguing that supporting abortion, saying, no, no, this, this is actually okay. That, that contradicts what the church of Jesus Christ has always taught. Because it's a moment in time where some of these things are trying to break off. Some people are trying to argue that, no, 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 like that was just cultural at that time. You know, what was being said in this, in this book, like that's outdated. It needs to catch. Guys, that's not how truth works. That's not how God works. Guys, sometimes there's hard truth and we've got to align ourselves with God's truth. Even if it's, especially if it's hard. Because if I don't, look, the danger, the most dangerous thing is convincing myself that something is true when it's actually not. It's saying that, no, no, this is what I really, really, really want. And God loves me, right? So God's gonna give me that thing that I really, really, really want. And so even though it says this, in the sacred scriptures that the church has believed and held for 2,000 years, my interpretation is correct. That's, That's a dangerous thing. And it's, it's led a lot of my friends astray, away from Jesus. God, have mercy on us all. Because here's the thing, it's terrifying and humbling that we all have the ability to do this. Every one of us, none of us are above this, uh, being able to twist this in such a way to justify something because it's what we want, even though it doesn't align with truth. We have to humble ourselves and say, God, even if it hurts, even if this is not what I want, Lord, I've got, I've got to get in line with your truth, with whatever you say. All right, to justify sin because the truth is just, 
Uh, a lot of times, like, we follow our hearts and justify sin because the truth is too inconvenient and would require legitimate sacrifice. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. That is a call to come and die. Following Jesus is not an easy thing. It, 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 it is not an easy thing, but it's a good thing. It is a good thing. I love, I love that, uh, that moment in um, Chronicles of Narnia. I believe it's Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when the kids are talking to the beavers and they're asking about Aslan, who is the representative of Jesus in this big allegory that C.S. Lewis wrote. And they're like, is he safe? Like, he's a lion. Is he safe? And one of the beavers says, well, of course not. He's a lion but he's good. Like he's not safe, but he's good. It's going to challenge us. It's going to, we're, we're going to have to lay some things down. We're going to have to pick up a cross, an instrument of suffering and carry that and lay some things down that are hard to lay down, but it's worth it. There, we can't afford to justify sin in order to follow our hearts. This is why it says cursed, it is cursed to trust in mankind, to follow your heart. Mankind in our own sin cannot save. Mankind in sin cannot save. So don't follow your heart. Instead, follow your heart. Okay, here we go. Let's look at some more context. Psalm chapter 37 starting in verse 3. According to the scriptures, this is amazing advice. Get ready. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. According to the scripture. This is good advice to follow your heart. Listen, he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land, live securely. Take delight in the Lord. What will he do? He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, here's the thing. This is the incredible thing. It's not that when I, when I take delight in God, like all of the things that I've, that I've wanted uh, imperfectly throughout my life, he's going to be like, oh, yeah, you get the Ferrari. Yeah, you get, uh, you, know, you get to win the lottery. Like, yeah, sure, that's a desire you have. Yeah, I'm going to fulfill it. No, here's, here's the amazing thing is when we delight in the Lord, it's like we have this heart, and he actually places desires in our hearts that are from him. He puts his own desires in our hearts and then fulfills those desires. Isn't that good? That's when we can follow our heart, is when we offer this heart to the Lord and he places his own desires in our heart and then he fulfills those desires. That is, that is when this is excellent advice. And listen, this is, this is partly why Jesus taught us to pray the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer that we were talking about earlier. God, the Father of Jesus, will give his Son anything that he asks for. We who have committed our lives to Jesus and have been brought into the divine family have been instructed by Jesus to call God our own father. We are in this family. We get to say the same name because it's a reality. The truth says so. We get to, we get to say, refer to the creator of everything as our own father because that's reality. And not only that, Jesus gives us his own words in the prayer to pray, thy will be done. In that prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this prayer and I am asking, I am pleading, God, fulfill your desires. Like, give me your will. Put your will in my heart and then fulfill it. Your will be done in my life here on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the key. I've heard this before, and I think this is so true, that prayer doesn't change God. It changes us. 
When we, if we are regularly praying that our Father's will be done in Jesus' name and in his authority, won't he do it? Won't he do it? If we're asking God to fulfill his will in Jesus' name, won't he do it? Yes, he'll do it. He'll do it. When we regularly, regularly pray this, we lead our hearts in the right direction and we allow God to place his own will within our hearts and minds his, his own desires for us to accomplish, for him to fulfill. And the other part that I love, just, just real quick in that, in that passage, Psalm 37, trust in the Lord, do what is good, dwell in the land and live securely. Listen, there's a lot of things that can kill babies out in the world. I know this as a father of a 10-month-old at this point. Kids, Babies in particular, and puppies, they do this too, they will get into stuff that can seriously hurt themselves, like in a bad way. And so constantly, Josephine's in the crawling stage, so that's our life now. We're just following this kid around, like, nope, you can't eat that. Nope, you can't touch that. Nope. Like, all, all these things. Um, but, yeah, when she's going around our home or out in the world, like, Th these innocent things that she's grabbing for, that she's reaching for, that she's desiring, they could legitimately harm her. Uh, so it, when she's out without any boundaries, yeah, <laughs> it's not a good thing to let her follow her heart as she wishes when she's not under our safety. But that's why pack and plays exist. Yes, like this is so good. When I put her in there, she can follow her heart because she's in the right context to follow her heart. She's in the right parameters so, to follow her heart. She can play with any of these toys in there. She can crawl up on the sides and shake the whole thing. She's good. She's safe. She's secure because she's in daddy's parameters and his boundaries that he's set up for her so that she can be safe and follow her heart because she's where her father wants her to be. That's the proper context to follow your heart is in the father's will. Context matters. Even the context with which we listen to this advice. Before Christ, terrible advice to listen to. But when my heart has been yielded to the Lordship of Christ, this is amazing advice. Even in that first passage, I just want to read this. I don't know if you noticed this, but the first time we read that passage, we read it out of context. We only read verses 5 and 6 and 9 and 10. Let's read the whole thing together now. Verses 5 through 10. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He will make human flesh his strength and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper in the Arava. He cannot see when good comes but dwells in the parched places in the wilderness, in salt land where no one lives. The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by the water. It sends out its roots towards a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. The heart is deceitful more than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart to give each according to his own way what his actions deserve. The person who trusts in mankind is cursed. They are not a person who should follow their hearts. The person who trusts in the Lord is blessed. They are the person that can and should follow their heart because the Father is putting his own desires into their heart for them to follow so they can be that tree planted by the waters, producing fruit in all seasons. You don't have to worry about it because God's put you in the proper context so that you can do what he's put in your heart to do. The old covenant was broken by sinful people like you and me. But the new covenant, which began through Jesus Christ laying himself down on the cross for our sins, when he inaugurated the church on that first Pentecost, he filled every Christ follower with the Holy Spirit to empower us to do what was previously impossible, to give us the ability to follow our hearts in the proper context. So to wrap it up, I just want us to reflect on our current cultural, societal context, okay? So 20th century philosopher 
John Paul Sartre, um, coined this phrase. So he, he departed from traditional philosophical thought about like purpose. I think purpose is a really, really powerful thing. When we're thinking about our lives, that's what draws people to God a whole lot. I know it, I know it does for me. Like one of the reasons I love following Jesus is because it actually gives purpose to every single area of my life. Like nothing is worthless, even and especially the suffering that I endure. Jesus makes it worth it. If I don't have them, then it's pointless, it's meaningless. I can give myself over to nihilism, there's no hope. But in Jesus there is. John Paul Sartre, not a Christian, he coins this phrase. He says that existence precedes essence. Essentially, what we're getting at here is that I come into this world and then I determine what my purpose is. I come into this world and then I decide what is right and true and good and for me. Do you see the line of where we're at today with what's going on and the problem of sin in our own hearts? Because that's what it is, is me saying, I am the sole arbiter of truth. I come up with what is right, what is good, what is true. Your truth, my truth. That's not how truth works, though. That's not it. If something is true, then it's true, regardless of how we feel about it. This, that's, why, that's why we have the phrase hard truth, because sometimes truth is just really hard to get on board with, but it's true. I heard, a, I heard a, a, this um, theologian, Dr. Christopher West, um, say like, that where we have gone with society now is, uh, we've heard Descartes, I think, therefore I am. We've progressed now to, I think, therefore I am, whatever I think I am. Just whatever I think, whatever I feel, that's who I actually am, rather than truth being something objective, truth something being that we can align ourselves with. Rather, the, the, where we're at today, the danger is saying that, no, I'm gonna conform truth to my own desires. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. When we do that, we put the cart before the horse, and this isn't how truth works. Truth is, is an objective standard outside of ourselves that we must come into alignment with if we're going to live fulfilled lives, even if it's an inconvenient, a hard truth, a truth that requires sacrifice of my will. It's worth it. All right, disagreeing with gravity is an exhausting way to live. That's an exhausting way to live. If I'm just constantly jumping up everywhere, like, no, I'm gonna fight this, ah! Like, you're just gonna burn yourself out. It's just gonna be exhausting. And we do this all the time with the truth of Jesus Christ. It is the same with him. Like, if Jesus is who he says he is, he is worth following. If his words are true, then we must have the same response as Peter to one of Jesus' most difficult truths. You can find this in John chapter six, but this was a moment where a bunch of disciples walked away from Jesus because Jesus said something that was hard for them to get on board with. And then he looks at his closest disciples and he says, are you guys gonna leave me too? And Peter responds on behalf of the disciples. I love Peter in his honesty. He says, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's like, I don't have to even like this sometimes. But if it's true, Lord, if you are who you say you are, I've, I'm gonna follow you, just help me. Help me to follow you. Change my heart. I'm not gonna try to change you. I wanna know you as you are, not as who I want you to be. I'm gonna know you as the truth, amen? This is our call today. Don't follow your heart, instead, follow your heart. The context makes the whole difference, right? Don't follow your heart when it's ruled and governed by desires that are outside of Christ. Instead, let us offer our hearts to Jesus every single day so that he can give us new hearts with his own desires, which he is sure to fulfill. And then we will be free to follow our hearts. Let's close with the Psalm 37. 
verse three through six. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. That's the next step for those of us in this room who have never, ever submitted their lives to Jesus. If you're tired of following your own heart and at leaving you unquenched and dissatisfied, repent. That just means turn away from what you've been doing. Submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and he has promised to give you a brand new heart and fill it with his own desires so that you can live an actually fulfilled life that was previously impossible. What was impossible for man is possible for God. That's what Jesus wants to do today. If you've never made a decision to follow Christ, today's that day. Don't delay, trust him and obey. For my friends who have entered into that covenant relationship, the application is the same. Let us today pray the same way that Jesus told us to pray. It's for our Father's will to be done in our lives to enable us to follow our heart in Christ.